So welcome everybody to the Spree Seminar Series. This is an off day, uh, so uh, hopefully the video recording will be available for people later. Um, but today we got two presenters um, from USM in Chile. Um, I guess first Rodrigo, mm -hmm. uh, and then followed by Mario. Um, and they're going to talk about uh, solar research and development um, at their university. Okay, hi everyone. My name is Rodrigo Barraza. So I will do an overview of some of the projects that are running right now in the, on our lab. So, but first, I'm not the first, and Mario is not the first, so we have an history first. So later I, I will talk about what is the laboratory right now and what is the ongoing uh, project that we are working about. So solar, desalin solar desalination first, uh, later something of uh, CSP, concentrated solar power, also related with CSP, soiling effects on, on the concentration, and Mario will talk about solar chemistry. So the renewable energy studies began on the university at the 1950, the professor Julio Hirschman began with the solar energy research. <coughs> yeah? And he founded the solar energy lab at that time in 1960. So what was the purpose of that? So Chile doesn't have many um, fossil fuels resources, so, but we have really rich in terms of solar, wind energy and geothermal. So with the help of the Solar Energy Society in the 1960s and with the president of the Solar Energy Society, Farrington Daniels, the Solar Energy Lab was founded in the university. Yeah? With the help of the solar community in the world, uh, our founder, uh, Julio Hirschman was invited to get some uh, capacitation on solar energy uh, and visiting some lab on United States, Israel, and France. So what we have done from 1960 to now, so the, sol the National Sol Solarimetric Archive was admi administrative by the university. We started with seven measurement stations in 1960, and from the 60 to the 84, it accumulated data from 106 stations that they accumulate 1,000 years station of actinograph of solar radiation and 1,300 years of heliograph data. Yeah, after 1984, yeah, this all instrument, the actinograph that, that, that and the result of the actinograph solar radiation that is shown in this picture, yeah, it was all technology and we started with the computer, with the actual pyranometers, pyreliometers and all of the solar resource instrument that we use right now. So, all of the information that was captured by the school and analyzed by the school was, was, is available in a book that is called the Solarimetric Archive of Chile. Yeah? And it has a station from the northern uh, part of the country up to the southern part of the country. So we have some history in destillation. Uh, we, ha we had an old solar steel plant in the northern of Chile that, uh, that produced a cubic meter per day and it has installed 160 square meter of solar collection. Also we have done at, the, at that time some development on solar water heating and solar stoves. Yeah, but right now we continue that doing some of this stuff but also we are working in new solar research. So w our facilities, we have an open sky lab 
that is in the one of our satellites school, that is the Jose Miguel Carrera uh, campus. Yeah, that we have some indoor labs and also some outdoor labs. But also we have some facilities in the big campus that is in the in Valparaíso and in the satellite that I wore in Santiago. So, so but no, all of our research is experimental. Many of them is computational modeling, and so and it is in the same uh, line with our mechanical engineering program. So we have a master that it was it it, pr it was reformulated in 2009, and a doctorate program that it was also reformulated in 2015. So. And these two programs are aligned with computational modeling. So in the, in the Renewable Energy Lab, we work not only mechanical engineers, also work people from electrical engineers and from architecture. What are we working right now? So one of the projects that I love is solar desalination, but using a humidification, dehumidification unit. I will explain later why, but what is the motivation of that? So this is the map of Chile. And the, on the left, you will see what was the picture of 1987. So all of that is blue. It means that the water availability is OK. And other than is yellow to red, to brown, it means that there is a scarcity of water. So the people in Chile, most of the people around the 60, 70 percent live around this part. Yeah? The capital Santiago is here. So in 1987, it was it, 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 this region it doesn't have, it didn't have enough water. Yeah? If we look the picture at 2010, we see that the situation is worse than 23 years before. Yeah? And the projection for 2025 20, is worse than that. So, and at least in the North region, we will have an, a, a scarcity around 80% of what people and in the industry need to live. So the question is, how do we solve that? So we have uh, some of water source. We have many of salt lakes. We have many of salt lakes on the northern part. We also have mining waste that has a lot of water. Also, we have a small river in the north, but the problem that because they run over the desert, they, they have many minerals that are not healthy, like borium and like arsenic. Also, we have some oasis that has the same problem, and also we have a lot of seawater. Yeah? So solar desalination seems to be a good idea. Yeah? And I studied before multi-effect desalination, yeah, but I, I think that the focus of multi-effect desalination is bigger process, uh, bigger production, and I think that maybe the industry will take the effort to solve that problem. But I think that for one family or a group of a small family that live far away of the cities, maybe now no one is looking for a solution. So for that, I have been focused my research on humidification and dehumidification. Yeah. The humidification and dehumidification, a micro scale solar dis desalination unit has the advantage that it could be autonomous. And if we compare with other technologies like reverse osmosis or solar steels, yeah, the reverse osmosis it may have the problem if the power 
is not probably in a constant way, it might have some problem with uh, falling, yeah, and the membrane will be deteriorated, so it could be a problem. Also, they need like a constant power supply for the same reason. The solar steel may be a good idea, but the the efficiency is a little low. Yeah, it's around 0.5. The gain output ratio. It means that it compares how much energy I need to dis to distillate, like one kilogram of water, and how much my desalination unit is distillate. Yeah. So the gain output ratio of a solar steel is around 0.5. So I'm not recovering any energy and I'm using the double that I will use if I will distillate directly with a heat source that is applied directly to the to the distillate process. The humidification dehumidification has a gain op output ratio that could vary from 0.5 to 4.5, but I will explain later also, it depends on the number of stages that it has. Another, alter another advantage of this technology is that it requires a low enthalpy energy supply, so with flat solar collector it could be enough. And also it could be autonomous because I could provide the, the heating source with solar collector and the electricity with photovoltaic panels. So what is a humidification dehumidification concept? It's the water cycle, but in the water cycle we encapsulate these three processes. The humidification, the thermal energy supply, and the dehumidification. So on this picture, the seawater is going to the unit, is preheated in the in the dehumidifier, it receives more energy in the solar collector and it's spray over a stream of air that is running on contact flow. This one water hit the air and when and because the, the heat is, that is produced on the air, the capacity to transport water is increased. Yeah? This saturated air is going to the dehumidifier and is cooled down with the seawater and because that's cooled down, yeah, water is raining here and drinkable water is produced. So this is a closed system for the air and the air is cold here but it's uh, still saturated and it goes again to the humidifier. So if we look in a psychrometric chart we see that we, mo we, move, we move always on the saturated line, but we are changing temperature of the air, and the, if we look on that in this axis, we increase the amount of absolute water that the air is carried out. So first we design, and later we contract one unit, like this, it looks like that. This is the, here are the solar collector, here is the dehumidifier or the condenser, here is the heat exchanger to isolate the solar uh, heating circuit from the seawater circuit, and this is the fan that moves the air, and here is the humidifier. So the equipment is instrumented, with thermocouples, yeah, with anemometers, with you, uh, with hygrometers, yeah, with rotameters, and all of the parameters that we need to measure flow, uh, temperature, humidity, and also solar radiation. So here on the picture. This represents the solar collector, this is the humidifier, this is the condenser. The blue line is the seawater that is coming out and later is a spray on the humidifier. So also we have many numerical models to represent several configurations of this. 
Yeah, this is a validation. It's part of one of our papers that we have on this line that is in revision right now. And, and this is the, the validation on the humidifier. The, the dots are the experimental versus the modeling. So at the relation one and one, it means how good is the uh, model. Yeah. This is the control volume of what happened on the humidifier. That is the is simple, but the, it's the most complicated equipment of the of the system that ha that has heat transfer and also mass transfer involved. So, how much water this equipment produces? This is one day, and the the line is the model. The dot are the experimental. So. Uh, we are producing around this day 16 kilograms per day. It starts at 10, it finishes around 6 p.m. So, and the small difference is because we, we, we began a little late this day, so there is a um, transient problem that explains a little the, the difference at the first hour that the equipment is working. So another day, some global, uh, some daily performance parameters. So the fair edge water production for uh, March 27 is around 50 liters per day. With that radiation for the other day, it has a gain output ratio of point, point, point 0.54. Yeah, it's not perfect, but it's a good start. So we did a numerical model, so to try to optimize a little the, the, the water production. So we were around here, but it's possible with controlling the mass flow of air and the mass flow of water to produce around four, kilo, four liter per hour with wood radiation. So this is another picture of something similar here we show the gain output ratio and how it behaves for the mass air flow and the water mass flow rate. Yeah, the optimal is around here. So yeah, next step on that research. So we need to to try to have long-term collection of experimental data, what see what happened with wildlife on our equipment so we will have if we took if we take water from the seawater so it has some life that maybe will produce some problem on some of the equipment we need to check about that and how to control that also try to 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 produce a more economical unit because it's a little expensive to solve a problem if we are thinking in poor people also now we are working on on new configuration i will show here and also it could be combined with thermal energy storage. So what we are doing now, we are checking if what happens if we have more stages. So what happens if we have not only one, if two, three, four. It seems to be that with two, we can increase the production in 50%. And it seems to be if you go to three, maybe it's not a good idea because we are increasing a little more and the four is not recovering too much energy. But with this plot, as a consequence of this information, we are c building this unit right now that it has two stages, and it should be running, I hope, on March to have new data to, to continue with our research. So we have worked before, as, as I told before, on multi-effect desalination. So one of our model that is published on the on one of a journal paper show this result is a is a 12 effect uh, unit that was validated and also was tested with information from Chile from different uh, places with different radiation and how much will be the production for this unit. So the problem with this development is that we don't still have an experimental unit to check some doubt that we have on that research that 
are so summarized here that we need to, there are some problems on the literature that with the heat transfer coefficient between the, li the liquid falling film boiling on evaporation and thin vacuum conditions. So there is no uh, unique theory here and the, and the results seem to be really dependent of this information. So also we are in working on concentrated solar power, but why? Because Chile has a greater potential not only with solar, wind and electricity, and we have around 1.8 terawatt that we can have installed to produce electricity. Yeah? If this is the map of Chile, if you see the, the red and yellow one is solar potential, the blue one is, is hydroelectric and the green one is eolic or wind energy. So the difference between the red and yellow, it means that the yellow is more likely to be used as photovoltaic and the red is more likely to be used as CSP. So also the Chilean government has a goal that the 60% of the electricity comes from renewable energy for 2035. Yeah, only potential resources. We have, yeah, we have maybe one gigawatt on solar energy right now in photovoltaic, and we have a plant that is under construction of 100 megawatt on CSP. But and that's not considered in that picture. No, it's not considered. That is only potential. And no? what's the criteria to uh, difference PV and CSP? Yeah, yeah it depends on cloud. Uh, cloud. Is if it's more clear is better for CSP. If, uh, if you have more diffuse radiation, it could be a PV doesn't have many problems and it works okay. But the CSP is really affected by diffuse. Is th there are much diffuse. So, but, okay, this is part of the motivation, but we are really motivated to see what happens when this, when the CSP power plant are working under variable conditions. So yeah, the first one that is related with sunrise and sunset is kind of obvious, but when we have cloud ch shading, the problem with the cloud arrive is not a big problem. The big problem is where the cloud is leaving out the solar field because a bigger change of, of the power concentration over the receiver is produced and it produces like thermal stresses that can destroy the solar receiver. Yeah? Also try to get some information on the model about heliostat focus error related by wind and by tracker delay. So what are we doing with that? So a CSP power plant is formed by a by a solar field of heliostat, uh, a tower, solar receiver. It could have a storage unit using molten salt, and it has a power block. Yeah. So what uh, is our plan to build a model that consider everything, and it could be flexible to analyze like uh, variable conditions. So for now, we are working. We have a really good model for the heliostat field and for the power block with new technology. This is a ranking circuit that we are working with a Brighton CO2 uh, supercritical cycle. Yeah. So we have a model. This is a typical model of Eliosta that considers reflectivity, cosine effect, attenuation, spillage, shading, and blocking. Yeah. We have validated our software the B part that is in the right is our software. The A is obtained by Collado et al. 2012. Yeah, and they have they are similar. Also, if we see how this heliostat work with the solar receiver, so okay, we need to have in mind that the the sun or the ray of the sun is not a ray; it's a 
cone, yeah, and it cone has a distribution of of energy that could be a convolution or could be a salt tracer model. We work with the convolution that is a, a Gaussian model that is shown on the equation, and it produces in our model this treatment. We discretize the solar receiver. We projected one of the plane that is uh, orthogonal to the solar radiation. We produce the 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 image of the of the solar field here, and later we change coordinate again and put in the in the solar receiver. Yeah, this is with six. This is with twelve uh, panels. It's more cylindrical. Yeah, and, and we are trying to see how it work during the day. Uh, it's not working. Uh, it's in it times. Yeah, it's the I, uh, yeah, it seems to be, yeah. Okay. But what it should be shown here is that the variation of the of the uh, uh, of the transient solar flux that the receiver is receiving during the day. Yeah. And it will vary how much energy is concentrated on the solar receiver. Also, we are interested to, to work with what happens if we have a cloud model. So we produce a fractal. And with the fractal, we do a cut with a plane. And this cut with a plane, I've done six, we produce a cloud. That, uh, it's, no, it's not showing. Yeah, it's, it's in the stick. Let me check. This is how chains on the solar receiver is a little quick, but it is it the, these are the from the sunrise to the sunset how the solar the solar flux is changing on the receiver. And also we have how a cloud our cloud model work. So because of the there are different parts of the fractal, different kind of configuration of cloud are produced. So and our idea next is that is to include this that affect and then cover some part of the heliostat and how this affect the variation of the flux on the solar receiver. And with that, calculate how much is the stress on the receiver and it will give you some information to work about the control of the each heliostat to produce, to avoid a catastrophic event. Also, we are working on the power on the power flow. We are not working with a traditional ranking cycle. We are working with a CS, uh, a supercritical di carbon dioxide Brighton cycle, because if we have enough temperature on the storage part, it seems to be more efficient than a traditional ranking cycle. But also in more of the research is focused on the steady state operation and we are working on the transient behavior. Yeah. There are many configurations for a Brighton cycle with, CO, uh, with supercritical CO2. We are working with the, recompre the recompression configuration that seems to be one of the more prom promising configurations. Here we have the the heat exchange that 
interact with the thermal storage. In this case, I call solar receiver. And we have a turbine, two compressor, and two heat exchanger. And one of the stream that is coming from the low temperature side of the heat exchanger is not the same that is passing through the first heat exchanger than this passing through the second heat exchanger. So we can change how much is compressed by the second compressor and we can uh, equilibrate in different way the configuration that and the efficiency of the cycle chain uh, according to that. We call how much we pass over the second, like we, we, we call the compression factor that I will show later. So we validated on the steady state with some information on the literature. We used Derby to use that. Our model seemed to work really well. Yeah, but we have done some sensitivity analysis and we can see that the recompression factor seem to be affected not because the heat that is receiving how it changes, but it affects because how what is the temperature of the ambient that I'm using to cool the stream here. If I'm the problem here, so it seems to be really sensitive to, to the fluid that is outside here to cool the system. If we are thinking in CSP, generally a CSP good place it has it is really far from the from the shore, and also there are not many water availabilities, so this cooler should be dry. It de it means that it depends really of the temperature of the air. So what we see here that if the temperature of the air change, it affects how much the compression factor I need to use. And it means that I cannot, so if I keep a fixed recompletion factor, the efficiency of the cycle will be around the black dot here. But if I optimize at each temperature what is the right recompletion factor, I could produce more energy if I keep constant the recompletion factor. So in this case, with, the, with some temperature and some radiation from Chile, we can get a 6% more efficiency if we control the recompression factor according to ambient condition. So this is part of that. And to give some time to Mario, so I will talk from soiling effect on solar concentrator. This is a more experimental research. And we are working with Fraunhofer and CERC Chile, that is the Solar Energy Research Center in Chile. So the idea is to know how the soiling affect the CSP operation. So there are some theory about that. So it means that so there for some particular mirror, it has a, a reflectivity about 94 when it's clean, and it could go down up to 70 when it's dirty. So we have been selected for strategic location for CSP in Chile, and we have installed this unit with mirrors to measure how they, to measure what is the reflectivity when they get dirty. We use a reflectometer to measure that, and we have different orientation, north, south, west, east, and different angle, 0 to 90. And this with two arms, it has a mirror that are clean periodically, another, an, another mirror that they, they are not clean at all, they, they keep dirty. And we have measured from December to June, that was is the last date on this plot, what is the cleanless factor? So what is the reflectivity after two months of no clean? And it start to decrease. Yeah. The red one is the without inclination and the 
and the purple is with 90 degrees. Also, this is when we don't clean the mirror, and for this reason it's going down always. And another thing that we are looking for is what happens if we clean periodically? What happens with the reflectivity? It is again the same than before or no? And we are measuring that after some cleaning we are losing up to 2% of the original reflectivity in six months. So, Mario? Uh, 